Happy Sabbath, church. Are you feeling happy today? The weather is beautiful. I know you're inside, but soon you'll be able to go outside and enjoy it. Um, but God has something He wants to share with us this morning, and so I'm just going to pray one more time before we begin. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, you are the great lover of souls, and you woo us with your everlasting love, and you're trying to draw all people unto you, for you love us, and you want to guide us and direct us in our journey in this life, and Lord, I just pray that right now that you would be faithful and true, as we just heard about in that beautiful song, to speak to our hearts to guide us and direct us through this time as we commune with you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that you would use me as a simple vessel to bring about your words and your will to be done, and that you would hide me behind your cross and you would be clearly seen and glorified today, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I've titled the message, Journey to Godliness. Now, if you don't like the word godliness, you could use Christ-likeness. It's the same thing. But the reality is we're all in a journey of life. And this journey is sometimes easy. Sometimes it's hard. Um, as the, the verse we read there in 1 Timothy, the, the bodily exercise profits a little. How many were excited that they don't have to do too much exercise? <laughs> exercise is very good for us. But godliness is the goal. Christ-likeness is the goal. And Paul often described this journey we're all going through as like a race. And I've run races. I don't particularly like them, um, but I run them because it's good for me. It helps me relieve my stresses and get out and just run. And uh, any, anybody really like running besides my wife? Um, it's one of those things, if you run a race, you feel good sometimes, like right at the beginning, you, maybe you're a little nervous, apprehension is there, but you have the energy to go, and then after a little while, it's like, okay, this isn't so fun anymore, and sometimes life is a little bit like that, and then there's those phases where you're excited because you're almost at the end, but at the same time, you're like, I can't make it, it's so hard, I've been running so long, and life is sometimes like that. This journey we go through, I... I found a, a little book, a, a man, he, he titles the, the book, Gorillas of Grace. Well, uh, it's always something doesn't want to work in church. <laughs> Here we go. He wrote this, kind of writing out a prayer, if you will, maybe describing what this might be like. He said, it would be easier for me to pray if I were clear and of a single mind and a pure heart, if I could be done hiding from myself and from you, even in my prayers, he says. But I am who I am, mixture of motives and excuses, blur of memories, quiver of hopes, knot of fear, tangle of confusion, and restless in love for love. I wander somewhere between gratitude and grievance, wonder and routine, high resolve and undone dreams, generous impulses and unpaid bills, Come find me, Lord, be with me exactly as I am, so I can begin to be yours. I don't know, I, my words don't, don't usually sound that pretty when I'm praying. Um, maybe he gave it more thought, but doesn't it well describe sometimes how we feel? It seems like we have great hopes, great ambitions. We want to be like Jesus, don't we? You know, when we first come into the faith and believe in Jesus and recognize Him as our Savior, we have so much excitement, and we want to be just like Jesus. But then many times we, we get done with the day, we've blown our top and yelled at someone, we look in the mirror and we think, I look nothing like Jesus. Anybody ever felt that way? And we're just thinking, man, this journey, this, this trial of life, I wonder if I'm ever really going to get there. And what I found in, in my journey is there's only one way to make sure you stay on course. Keep looking to the finish line. Keep looking to Jesus. As I keep looking to Him, the good news is He's always faithful and true. He's always there to pick me up, to carry me through. And it doesn't matter how far you fall, how much you've messed up. If you'll look to Him and ask for help, He will always pick us up. This morning... Um, 
looking at what the goal is, here's a couple of quotes for us. Our Father Cares, page 109, says, We must be Christ-like. Let us strive to make our lives what Christ designs them to be, full of the fragrance of love to God and our fellow man, full of Christ's own divine spirit, full of holy aspirations towards God, rich in the beauty of Christ's likeness. Really, I mean, if you want to summarize what is the goal of being a Christian, be like Christ. It's not that complicated. It really is being like Jesus. And if we're going to be like Jesus, guess what? It's going to be attractive to others. The evangelistic part that we always dread, that just kind of naturally happens when you look like Jesus. The world is naturally attracted when you are as beautiful as Jesus is in the way you live your life. Um, as we saw there in 1 Timothy, our bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for how many things? All things. Everything that is a challenge, everything, the more you're like Jesus, the more everything in life can be better and easier. Amen? Amen. Having promise of the life that now is, that's right now and of that which is to come. A.W. Tozer said this journey of faith that you might call it, faith is not merely a journey for the feet, but it is a journey for the heart. You know, we sometimes walk through life, we walk through the motions, sometimes we walk through the motions of church. We know we're supposed to get up, we're supposed to dress nice, we're supposed to show up to church, we're supposed to maybe comment in Sabbath school, maybe we just sit there, whatever you're comfortable with, but we, we go through the motions, don't we? Sometimes I've, I've found many people tell me even their morning devotions, it just feels like going through the motions. Sometimes we just need to go through them, even if we don't feel it, though. You know, Christianity isn't all about feeling a high and a bliss all the time. It's entrusting in the one that will always be there. Amen? Amen? Another man, Francis Chan, put it this way. He says, but God does not call us to be comfortable. He calls us to trust him so completely that we are unafraid to put ourselves in a situation where we will be in trouble if he doesn't come through. Does that describe a life of faith? God wants us to trust in Him so much that we're going to get ourselves into a predicament where, God, you better show up or this is not going to be good for me. I think of situations in the Bible where we see this all over again, where Elijah says, all right, let's, let's build two altars and whoever's God answers by fire. And he says, just to make sure you guys understand, let's soak it in water. Now, if God didn't show up, can you imagine what they would have done to Elijah? They probably would have killed him. God wants us to trust in Him to the point where we move beyond where we know we've got this to where we know God's got this. He wants us to be in a journey where we're trusting the, in God the Father the way Jesus trusted in God the Father. He said that when they asked Jesus about the miracles, did He say, oh yeah, I did all this all by myself? Or did He say, I haven't done any of this. It's really the Father who works in me. It's that... It's that trust, that intimate relationship where you can trust God with everything. This morning, I want to look at about 10 or 12 different passages in Scripture. I find many times we relate to different passages at different times. Have you ever read a verse and thought, man, I've read that a hundred times and it never spoke to me like it did today? And that's because life is a journey as we go through it. And I've selected a handful of verses, and I want you to think about as we go through these, we're going to read them, and I want you to really think about which of these verses describe your walk with God today. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, what you aspire it to be, but what it is today, and then also think about where would you like it to be, because the answer is in Jesus. So let's look at a few verses this morning together. Um, the first one we're going to look at here is Psalm 34, verses 1 through 4. So this is a way of describing. This is, and I love the Psalms. You could probably find every high and low and everything in between in David's writings. He was one of those guys that could get up and start praying to God and say, God, what's going on? Why have you forsaken me? My enemies are conquering me, but woe is me. I'm sorry. You're good. Praise be the Lord in the end. So he kind of goes full circle over and over again, the highs and the lows. Here, Psalm 34, a wonderful chapter, verse 1 through 4 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. 
My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Now, this would kind of be like a mountaintop experience, it sounds like. As, you're, as you read that, you get this idea that God has delivered me from all my fears. Have you ever found that point where you were just terrified of something? I don't know what it was. Maybe it's public speaking. They say that's the highest fear of anything. And you get done having to come up and say something in front of church or in front of people, a classroom, public speaking class. And when you're done, it's like, okay, I lived. <laughs> You know, and it's like, God has delivered me from all my fears. I'm going to praise Him till the end of the earth because I made it. <laughs> I'm sure uh, a lot of students that just finished finals might feel that way right now. I, I made it. <laughs> all my fears are over. I'm finished. So this is one of those great ways. We, we hope we all feel that way all the time, but it's not always that way. And verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. You know, one of the things about tasting and seeing that God is good, doesn't that require some effort? Do you know if food tastes good if you've never put it in your mouth? No. Now, we could easily come to preconceived ideas, and I, I will very quickly admit, I, I smell the smell of durian. Anybody that knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> some of you are laughing, so you know it smells like sewage. It's a fruit and I don't know how anything can stink that bad and be something you want to put in your mouth. And so I've come to uh, preconceived conceptions there that uh, you, you have to taste and see. But the people that eat that stuff seem to get addicted to it. So I guess it's good, but they never convince me. But the idea here, <laughs> it should, I tried it once or twice. But the idea is that uh, we have to taste and see that God is good. It means you have to reach out and trust. It means you've got to go beyond that comfort zone of, I can do this and let God show that he's good. And even if he doesn't answer, the, the problem I find with so many people that come to me and say, I did that once, Pastor, it didn't work. Once? Sometimes I think we put God in a box where it says, okay, you better answer exactly this way at exactly this time or I'm not going to believe in you. But God will give us what is best for us, even if it's not what we prayed for. Because God is good all the time. And that's how God is. Let's look at another verse. Revelation 2, verses chapter, chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Here, it starts out really great. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. Maybe you've been working hard, trying to do things for God, and you don't like the evil around you. You have tested those who say they are apostles, those who claim to be preaching the truth and are not, and have found them liars. But it goes on, it says, And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now that last part hits hard, doesn't it? But if you think about where you're at right now, I found when I was first coming into the faith, I was so excited about what God had done. And I was just excited to share with people, and I, I still am. But I've gone through points where it wasn't as exciting as it was before. I saw things in the church. The church isn't perfect. We're full of sinners, right? Hospital for sinners. That's what church is supposed to be. And yeah, people have been hurt in church really badly. And sometimes they don't ever want to come back. But that isn't a reason to give up our first love. Because the reason we should come to church is because of who we worship here. And He is always faithful. And so sometimes, yeah, we might get hurt. But God is not real thrilled with us if we give up that first love. The love that drew us to the place. So some of us have been working hard in the church and maybe we just don't have the passion we used to. Maybe that describes where you're at now. Psalm 69, 1 through 3. Maybe some of us are feeling this way. Save me, O oh God. Just that starting should tell you where this is going, right? <laughs> For the waters have come up to my neck. I seek in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Sometimes we go through periods of life 
in this journey where, man, it just feels like you're just sunk. And you're wondering, did God abandon me? What's going on? How is this God's will? I find when I've been through those places, that's where I grew the most. That's when I prayed the most. And when I come out of it, hindsight's twenty twenty. they say, you can look back and say, okay, God, I see what you wanted me to learn, if you're willing to let him teach you. But here, sometimes we feel like we're just sinking. I think of the picture of Peter sinking in the water saying, Lord, help me. And sometimes that's what you need to do. And Jesus wasn't right next to him, but he quickly stuck out his hand and pulled him up. There's faith in trusting that God will pull us up no matter how far we sink. Amen? What about Mark 9.24? Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Some of us, we're in that place and it just, we believe in Jesus, but we need help with our unbelief. Sometimes it's easier to believe, um, I heard, I believe it was David Ashrick in one of his sermons, he says, he's called the I am, meaning the God of the present, not the God of the past, not the God of the future, but the God of right now. We often talk about the great miracles God's done in the past, we read those in the Bible, we also think of the great things he's going to do in the future, but is God really God right now? Because God can help us right now, he can help our unbelief. The problem is it's often not God's fault, it's our faith. And if we pray that prayer in sincerity, Lord, help my unbelief, will he not answer? He always does. So Mark 9, 24 is another place we might be in. Psalm 28, verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and with my song I will praise him. There has been times where I'm just so excited that God answered a prayer. I, I'm just literally ready to jump and excited. And I just want to sing. I'm not good at it. And so I better be in the car where there's no one else to listen. Because I just want to sing my song to God and sing praises to Him. And I do that sometimes when no one's listening. Um, maybe you do it in the shower. I don't know where you do it. But sometimes we need to just sing a praise out to God. You know, God is good, and we can rejoice and praise Him. It's amazing how when we praise God for the little things, it makes the other things in our lives kind of just seem small. Praise is one of the great cures for the struggle of life. When we praise Him, even when we don't feel it yet, I'm praising you because you're going to pull me out. I'm still feeling it's right here, but I'm praising you because you will pull me out. It's a way amazing how he will do that by simply praising him. So maybe we're in a place of praise. Psalm 42, another psalm. 1 through 5 says, As the deer pants for the water, and we sing a song about this, the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. We're hungering, thirsting for more of him. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? We're waiting for that time when he comes to take us home. My tears have been my food day and night. While they continually say to me, where is your God? Mockers, essentially. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul with many, for within me. For I used to go with the multitude. Now here, this may not be speaking of you, but it's, it gives the impression with the multitude. He's talking about with God's people. I used to be there. I used to go to church. I used to have faith. I used to, and I long for him, but I don't have him now. This is a lot of people that have walked away, that are struggling. They are used to go with the multitude, so their soul longs for that once again. I went with them, past tense, to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. I love that in, in, in David, as he reads through this, kind of describing the anguish if you were out of the church for a while, if you weren't really where you knew you needed to be, did you not long for something better when you weren't there? I did. 
I mean, anybody that's been there is when you're not really, when your life is falling apart and you don't have God in it, you want that hope, do you not? I believe the world is longing for Jesus because they don't know him by name, but they know they're longing for something deeper. We have that God-shaped hole in our heart and they long for him. People that have gone to church that have known, yeah, I need to go back, but it's amazing how the devil convinces them, nope, you've gone too far, can't go back. They'll judge you, they'll be critical. Uh, God, God will never accept you anymore, right? The father of lies keeps many from coming back. But scripture tells us, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. God will help. If you've got a friend, if you've got a loved one that is in that position where they've walked away for a while, keep praying. God is saying here, hope in me. I will give them the help of my presence, my countenance. Amen? Amen. Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12. You have turned me, turned for me my mourning into dancing. Now, now, now David's ready to dance. He got him in trouble a couple of times. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So this one, one time he's singing, another time he's dancing. Maybe we shouldn't talk about dancing. Adventists don't dance, right? <laughs> but sometimes you just feel like it, don't you? David did it. He got and he danced before the Lord. So he was just so excited about what God was doing. And then there's Ecclesiastes, the, the son of Solomon, the wisest man that's ever lived. And he had lived a life, and he kind of got to this point where uh, nothing matters anymore. It's kind of a, his picture that he gives of where he was at, at least in the initial chapters of Ecclesiastes, is one of almost despair. It's one of depression. It's not exactly a happy thing to read through sometimes. He says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Nothing even matters. Uh, what's the point? He goes on in verse 8 through 10, the same chapter. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. Does that not describe society today? We see it on the TV. We got to have it. Nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. He goes on. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. There is, is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. He's like, again, yeah, nothing new. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. This is a, not a happy view of where you should be, definitely, but it's one of those where we reach there sometimes. Sometimes I've met people that have lost a loved one, and quite honestly, they just see, well, what's the point? It's just a vicious cycle of remembering every holiday when they're not there, when we struggle, when we feel there's nothing there, but this is not a place God ever desires us to be. Amen? Amen. We go through it. There's some natural mourning, but God's desire is turn that mourning into joy. He wants us to recognize that we have a hope. No matter what happens, if we've trusted in Jesus, we get to have the greatest family reunion of all eternity. That day when anybody you've ever loved to love Jesus, they're all going to be there. And we're going to have a million years, a thousand years just to try in it. Well, it'll probably be more than a million, but a thousand years with the Lord to just catch up. And I am looking forward to that day. I'm glad Augustine is too. You, you, the rest of you can say amen too. But uh... <laughs> Psalm 63, 2 through 5, another one. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you, David says. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Now I know some of these sound similar, but they each give us a little bit different picture. Here he's wanting to raise holy hands as the Bible puts it. He wants to put his hands up and praise God. He's satisfied. He's longing for God. These pictures of what it should be. Here's another one in Acts 4.31. We see the disciples. This is right at Pentecost. 
This is how God wants us to all feel, right? It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. You know that word boldness? Do you know what it is in the Greek? Dynamus. Sound, any, sound like an English word? It's explosive. It's dynamite. They spoke with such power that it was just blowing up. They were so excited because they had a power that was besides them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. That is God's goal for all of us. Amen? I want to just walk you through three steps required in this journey to godliness. We've seen a little snapshot of different places maybe you're at. Maybe some of those appeal to you. Maybe you don't want to ever dance. Maybe that's not you, but maybe you want to sing. Whatever it is, God wants you to be in your happy place, and that happy place is in Him. It might include fuzzy things for some people and chocolate, and I don't know what your happy place is, but it should include Jesus. <laughs> Three steps required in this journey to godliness. The first is you need to have a desire, a hunger, a longing, a yearning to be like Jesus. Now, I found most people, when we first come in, this is there. God gives that to us, that initial desire to be like Him. If you don't desire to be like Jesus, guess what? You're probably not ever going to be like Him. Just saying. <laughs> you kind of have to want it, don't you? And so God puts it in us. Sometimes we lose that. Maybe it needs to be renewed within us. But God, if you don't have that hunger and that longing and that yearning to be like Jesus, ask Him for it. That's a prayer I'm pretty much guaranteeing you Jesus is going to answer. He will give you that yearning for something better. Because it doesn't take much of looking around the world to realize it's got to be better than this, right? So a hunger, a longing, a yearning, to a desire to be like Jesus. The second is a vision. Imagine what being like God or like Christ would look like. Now, if you want to be like God, but you don't even understand what that would look like in your life, it's kind of hard to accomplish it. And so one of the things I've found in this journey is you've got to really get your mind into the mentality of what would it be like? What would it look like if I was like Jesus? Well, there's some simple things in Scripture that it points out. The fruit of the Spirit is full of love, full of joy, full of peace, full of patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. What would it look like if you could be just reviled? People spat in your face and you didn't get angry, but wanted to just say, forgive them, Lord, they do not know what they're doing. You know, I, I was recently, someone had shared this story with me, and I, I forgive me because I've forgotten the little girl's name, but when racial discrimination was high in the United States, there was a picture of a young black girl going to a white school, and they had to have literally the U.S. Army escort this little girl to school. And as she was going into places during that time, there was often, there was just a lot of hate in people, and they'd have little coffins with little dolls in it that looked like her. I mean, just mean. And all this hatred was going on, and they noticed, a, a man noticed one day that every time they saw her, she was always calm, but her lips were moving. And they wondered, maybe that, that lip moving was her showing fear. They figured she must be scared. I mean, can you imagine everyone around you wanting to kill you? And she, she's just speaking this little thing. And so they, they actually did some tests on her and found out, no, she wasn't anxious. She wasn't afraid. She had perfect peace. In a surrounding that you shouldn't have had perfect peace. And they finally asked her, so what, what's with the lip moving? And she said, well, a pastor told me once that I need to be like Jesus. So every time I see them, I whisper, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And I thought, wow, that's being like Jesus. We need to be able to not let everything offend us so easy. Man, we live in a day and age where it's easy to offend people. I'm sure I've offended probably all of you at some point, <laughs> just because it's that easy to do, but we need to live in such a way where we're not offended. You know, there were very few things that got Jesus upset. It was when they were disfiguring who God was in the people's eyes. And the greatest people he was angry at was religious leaders because they were painting a picture of a monster rather than a God. 
not a God of love. So yeah, he was right to be angry at that. We need to be angry when there's a time to be angry at things, but we need to deal with it in the right way. We need to have a little tougher skin, shall we say. We need to imagine what it would be like, and then we need to have intentionality. Um, I put this little quote, this was just in my own mind, you don't drift towards godliness, it takes focused effort. You know, it's not just going to happen. You're not just going to naturally, oh, wake up one morning, hey, look, I'm like Jesus. (laughs) Anybody had that experience? I don't know about you, but uh, we have a ferocious enemy that tries to stop that from happening at all costs. He tries to unplug the pulpit mic, and he tries to get my clicker to stop working, and he he tries to frustrate us, doesn't he not? He tries to do anything he can. So this is the decision to do something about your desire and vision to be like God. You know, it takes some action. It's God that will change it, but we've got to actually step out in faith and cooperate with God. God doesn't just do it without any effort from our part. There is work in salvation, but you're, 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 all the things you work for and all the things you do won't save you. It's still Jesus, and it's still Jesus that transforms you, but it takes an effort to trust in Him day by day, does it not? It takes effort. There is effort involved, and there's intentionality when it comes to being Christ-like. And this, this looks different, I find, in many people's lives. What does that intentionality look like? Well, it means I'm going to get up a little earlier and actually have a devotion. For other people, it's, oh, I'm going to be a little bit more intentional. I'm going to talk to my neighbor about Jesus. Well, that's not comfortable for some of us. Maybe we know they're not going to want to listen to it, but we're going to try. That's uncomfortable, but that takes some intentionality. It means you were... You are specifically thinking and praying about from the beginning of your day, what opportunity, what divine appointment do you have for me today, Lord? How are you going to let me grow to be more like you today? Now, growing isn't always fun, is it? It's not always comfortable growing, but is it for our best interest? Absolutely. Is it going to be easy to let self die and choose Jesus? Absolutely not. But it's what we need to be doing, and we need to be intentional about doing it. It takes that effort. Desire of Ages, page 827, puts it this way. All who consecrate soul, body, and spirit to God will be constantly, constantly receiving a new endowment of physical and mental power. The inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. Through cooperation with Christ, they are complete in Him. And in their human weakness, they are enabled to do the deeds of omnipotence. Those are some very powerful words. You can take a picture, you can memorize it, but I want you to remember that one. If you consecrate your soul, body, and spirit, meaning I am choosing God today, I'm going to let God direct my journey, encourage my journey, uplift me when I fall. If I'm going to trust in Jesus, it says we will constantly receive new strength. The fact that we need a new endowment of physical and mental power means our mental and physical powers are going to get taxed. Working for God may tax your physical abilities. It may tax your mental abilities, but He will renew them. We have inexhaustible supplies of heaven, I want you to think about that. We're we're talking about the God who breathed everything that exists into existence by simply speaking. And he's saying that here we're hearing God, all his inexhaustible supplies are at our command. I think we forget when we pray just what power we have. We forget who we're talking to. We forget that God wants us to be overcomers, to overcome by the word of our testimony and by the, by the blood of the Lamb. We have unlimited power. It says we are able to do the deeds of omnipotence. Omnipotence is just a word for unlimited power. And this is exactly what the early disciples did. Did they not? Didn't, didn't when, remember when uh, they're at the house and the guy falls out the window and he dies? And Paul goes and raises him from the dead. This is what we're talking about. This is the potential each and every son and daughter of Christ has. Now, we're uncomfortable with that thought. I think most of us are thinking, I'm not going to be raising anybody from the dead. 
But this is the potential. If it's God's will and He directs you, there's no limits. There's no limits. God is still the same God as the past. He's the God that parted the Red Sea. He's the God that led a blind army into the camp of the, you know, His people. I mean, all these stories, God is still God. We need to remember how big our God is. So when He says, I'm going to take you on a journey where you're going to look more like me, His bidding is His enabling. He's going to actually help us do that as we trust in Him. I don't know, that makes me excited. It should make us excited. One more quote here. Christ Object Lessons, page 146 says, It is not the capabilities you now possess. What does that tell you? We're not there yet. It's not the capabilities you now possess or ever will have that will give you success. It is that which the Lord can do for you. We need to have far less confidence in what we can do, and it goes on, and have and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. He longs to have you reach after Him by faith. He longs to have you expect great things from Him. We have a big God. And we can expect great things from this great God. And maybe we need to be praying that prayer of the Father in Mark. Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, but you know what? I could up it a couple of notches. I could take it up a couple of steps. I could believe a little bit more. I could trust a little bit more. I could give a little bit more, whether that's time, money, you decide. I can give more, do more, be more because of Jesus. That's the gospel, friends. It's a journey to godliness. It's God's desire to reproduce His image in us that has been lost because of the fall. It's God's desire to help us look just like Him so that He can come to take us home. The question is, will we cooperate? That's the only question we have to ask. So we're going to look at, this is is kind of the, the closing verse I wanted to bring, because I think this is where we need to be. It says, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, speaking to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. You know where he's going, right? That's where we want to go. Whatever path he chooses to get us there, let's go with him boldly and in faith. Amen? Amen. Let's sing, take the world, but give me Jesus. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, truly the height, the depth, the breadth of your love and your mercy are endless. And you proved it on the cross. And so, Lord, forgive us as we have not often had all the joy and all the faith in this journey of life. But, Lord, I'm so thankful you understand the challenges and trials we go through. I'm so thankful that you never leave us, that you never forsake us, and that as we trust in you, the hand of omnipotence give us all the strength and encouragement we need. Lord, help us. Lord, it, it just it makes me excited inside to think of a church full of people so trusting in you that they become like you. What would that look like? What would it do to our community? What would it do to our faith? Lord, we want to be like you. We want to be godly people. We want it to profit us for now and in the future. We, we want to do what it takes. But Lord, help us, because we know it is not in our own strength. It's not anything we have or anything we're going to obtain by our own power. It's all the power is in you. So Lord, may we die and let you live in us, that you can shine forth brightly. Fill our cups, let them overflow, Lord, that all the world can see that Jesus lives in me. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath.